Yeah. Um, so as you can see, uh, like Tom, I also have a passion for graphic design. Uh, so hi, Dimux. Uh, I'm Matthias. Um, I work at Tio. Uh, we make online video players. Um, but today, we're going to be making something slightly different. Uh, we're going to be building an HTML5 video element from scratch. Um, the video element is what you see uh, every time you play a video in a web browser. Um, and it's what powers uh, every JavaScript player out there, like HLSJS, Shaka, TO player. Um, and if you're watching this talk online, uh, you're probably looking at a video element right now. Now, Carl Sagan famously said, if you wish to make a video element from scratch, uh, you must first invent the universe. Now, I only have about 10 minutes today, so I won't exactly go that far, um, but we'll still try uh, to make it work. So. Why would you want to do this when we already have a perfectly good built-in video element? Well, the video element makes a lot of decisions for us. Uh, when to decode the next frame, how many frames to decode in advance. Uh, and for some use cases, like low latency streaming, that might not be enough. Uh, we want to take control of decoding uh, on a much lower level there, fine-tune things even further. Um, also, because today we can actually do this efficiently. We've got the Codex API in Chrome, um, and that allows you to interface directly with the hardware decoder. Um, and the Eric Explainer even mentions that you should be able to build something like MSE on top of it. So to that I say, challenge accepted. Uh, let's put the theory into practice. Um, and we can try to make this into a running team here at Tinmax. Um, last year, Colin Miller replaced FFmpeg with Web Codex. Today, I'll replace the video element with Web Codex. Um, so maybe next year, someone can, I don't know, replace Smellovision with Web Codex. Submit a talk, would love to see that. Um, finally, this is a fun learning exercise. Uh, some of the things that we take for granted from a video element are actually tried quite tricky uh, when you actually try to make this yourself, um, so it should be interesting. Um, do note though, this is a toy implementation, and like if you have your kids uh, play with a toy kitchen, you wouldn't really want to eat whatever they cook up in there either, um, so don't do that. Uh, first things first, let's put the element in video element. Uh, we've got, we've got cu custom elements for that today, so we can just define our baby video element in JavaScript, put that on our page, um, put a canvas element in there um, so that we have somewhere to draw our video frames on, and that should work. There we go. We've got a black rectangle. Yay! Not too excited just yet. Very convoluted way to get a black rectangle on your screen, so let's put something extra in there. Um, we can control a video element entirely from JavaScript, but it's probably easier if we have like a UI with a play button and a seek bar in there um, so to do things with. You can build that in HTML and JavaScript and CSS yourself, but if it looks like a video element and it quacks like a video element, then you can use MediaChrome for your UI. Um, so you, this is the boilerplate for Media, media Chrome. You add, a media control, you add Media Chrome to your web page. Um, you wrap your video element in a media controller, uh, you put some UI components in there, and there you have a working UI. Wow. Um, it doesn't really do anything yet, because we haven't implemented anything in our video element itself, so let's keep going. Um, we want to first put some data in our video element. Um, the API for that is called, is called Media Source Extensions. Um, that, again, powers every JavaScript player out there. And logic is always the same. You create a media source with one or more source buffers. Um, you download some fragmented MP4 files that you got out of an HLS or a Dash or an HSP manifest. Uh, and then you append those to your source buffer. And that gets you data for your video. Um, of course, we're implementing this ourselves today. So the most important method is append buffer. Uh, we'll use mp4box.js to parse the incoming fragmented mp4 files. Um, the, the initialization segment contains the movie box that contains track and codec information, and we'll represent those as a video decoder config. Um, the, media the media segments then contain our uh, movie fragment boxes with media sample data, and we'll represent those as encoded video chunks later uh, to play with web codecs. So we've got some buffer. We can finally play a video. Um, so we'll have a simple clock uh, that advances uh, with the player's current time. And every time the browser wants to render a frame, we'll configure the, the video decoder if we haven't done that already. Uh, we'll find the correct frame in our buffer um, that was populated from the media segment. And then we'll decode that frame and then render it. And the rendering is actually quite easy with uh, web codecs, because you can just pass the video frame directly to draw image. And that just works. Really cool. Um, so of course. We gotta play Big Bug Bunny in our first video element. Yes, there it is. Um, if you're watching this talk online and it's looking a bit glitchy on your site, that's supposed to happen. We're not there yet. Uh, the PTS and the frame numbers is all wrong and 
there's lots of smearing going on. Um, so let's try to fix that. What is actually going on in this demo? Uh, well, the browser is rendering is at, is at, six, at 60 frames per second, but our video is 30 frames per second. So we're actually decoding every frame twice. That's not supposed to happen uh, because a frame depends on the previous frame, not on itself. So to fix that, we just add an extra check. If, the, if we've already decoded this frame, we'll, we don't decode it again and we just move on. So what does that look like? Okay, yeah, that does look more like big bug money to me. Okay, um, if it still looks glitchy on your end online, sorry, that's on you, check your connection. <laughs> so, what about seeking? What if we jump forward and backward in time? Logic should still work, right? We've got all of that stuff going on with finding Ethereum at current time. Uh, no, ooh, okay, that is really blocky and janky. Um, that's not how we remember it. So. What's going on this time? Well, there's two types of video frames. Um, we have got, we've got keyframes and delta frames. And if we end up on a delta frame after a seek, uh, then we cannot decode that independently. Uh, we need to decode all of its frame dependencies first. Usually that just means decoding from the last decoded sample that we've got in our buffer. Um, or if we're now uh, in a new group of pictures with a new keyframe, we have to start decoding from that keyframe. Um, note that this also handles a case that we didn't handle uh, earlier, uh, that we missed. Uh, if the display frame rate is smaller than the video frame rate, um, then we always need to decode multiple frames for every rendered frame. So this handles that too. Um, Note that um, if you have fewer keyframes in your video, you'll have more frame dependencies, and that means that seeking can become slower. So a takeaway from that, and one of the reasons why you should keep your key interval small is to keep seeking relatively uh, fast. Um, all right. So we've got seeking working now, I think. Yep, that's the right frame. That doesn't look janky. OK, good. We're on to do something good here. now. To make this a proper video player, um, if we only ever append new media data, then sooner or later, this is just gonna crash with an out of memory error. We don't want that. So the player needs a way to remove the media when it's no longer needed. Um, the API for that is called source buffer remove, uh, and it removes everything between a given start and end time. Now, if there are frames that depend on those frames in that interval, you can no longer decode those after you've removed them, so those also get removed with that same call. Um, in particular, if there's a keyframe in there in that removal range, um, then you remove the entire group of pictures that comes with it. Now, when should the player clean up its buffer? Um, it can do it proactively. Um, you can remove frames that are too far in the past because um, you no longer need them when you're doing forward playback. Um, again, you have to watch out um, that if, if, the, if you're too close to current time, you don't want to remove the keyframe that is being used to decode frames around current time. Otherwise, you can stall the decoder or cause glitches. You don't want that. Um, when you're seeking backwards, uh, you can also remove frames that are now too far ahead of current time. Um, but sometimes that's not enough. Um, sometimes um, the source buffer uh, might, ha might reach its limit earlier than that, and you have to react to that. Um, it'll throw a quota exceeded error at you, so your player should be able to handle that, um, reduce its buffering goal, and then uh, keep less buffer after current time. Uh, it should also postpone the next append until it can actually remove some data that it no longer needs, and then retry the append again. Now, with this, we can already play pretty simple streams, but of course, for a proper video player, we also want something like ABR, uh, so we want to be able to switch qualities. Uh, a quality switch usually means uh, a new codec config, so we just reconfigure our existing decoder with the new config, and that's most of the time good enough. However, in so for some streams, you have a problem if you have different qualities with different segment durations. So in this example, um, First, we have two segments in the 480p quality, and then we try a quality switch to the 720p quality, um, but that overlaps the second segment that we already have. That means that the second segment gets cut off a bit, and that might be fine, but if you're already playing in that second segment, you might, again, stall or glitch the decoder. So in general, you want your player to avoid that. Uh, you want your player to only try a quality switch a bit further from current time. Um, but in some cases, even that is not possible. If you really depleted your buffer, um, you can, you, and you have to do a down switch, you don't really have any other choice as to switching at current time. So even better, if you can alter your stream to align segment uh, boundaries across qualities, then you can avoid this problem entirely. So 
there we have it. We've built our own video element with most of the video API in place. Um, we can play streaming video. You can try this out yourself in Chrome today. Link is on the screen. Um, this uses web codecs, so you need a modern version of Chrome for this. Um, we learned on the way that decoding is quite tricky to get right, um, and that the video player needs to be very careful when it's cleaning its buffer and switching qualities. Um, Web Codex is also a pretty neat API. Like this is the first project I used it in, and it works quite well for its use case. Uh, I hope it catches on in other browsers to, so we can do more cool stuff with this. Um, couple of links if you can't get enough of Web Codex like me, um, and that'll be all from me. Thank you. Mm -hmm.